Well, uh, the rubber hits the road now because we've got um, two experts in um, cool. how to communicate <laughs> simple ideas, well, complex ideas simply and quickly. Simple, simple. We'll just keep it all simple. Simple, simple, simple. <laughs> simple, simple, simple. Um, uh, we have uh, Rod Lampert, uh, who is the Deputy Director of the Australian National Centre for Public Awareness of Science at the ANU. He's been involved in science communication research and practice for 19 years, um, developing and delivering tertiary <laughs> science communication courses, uh, consulted in numerous science-based organisations, UNESCO, CSRO and others. Uh, Rod is a frequent and often vocal public commentator on science, science communication, science and public policy, a regular on ABC Radio National's Research Filter, and co-hosts Kinda Thinky with Will Grant, and his partner in crime is Dr <laughs> Will Grant. Uh, and uh, Will is a writer, talker, researcher, thinker at the Australian National Centre for Public Awareness of Science at ANU. Most of his work is focused on the interaction of science, politics and climate change and how such interactions are changing with new technology. If you're into that kind of thing, he tweets at Will is at. And with Rod, he co-hosts Kind of Thinking. And these two guys are going to really have uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the approach to simple, projecting simple ideas simply and quickly. And then they're going to put you through some exercises, I think, uh, so that you can get the hang of it. So, guys, over to you. Thank you, sir. The applause, it's so loud. <laughs> I'll clap you. There you go. Thank you. Welcome, Rod. Thank you. Welcome, Will. I don't know who wrote the bios. <laughs> but I'm feeling older than I thought I was. Thank you. <laughs> we're, um, we're, we're supposed to... You've been talked at very heavily all day, is that right? People have been talking at you and you've been sitting there going... Lots of august, wise people. Oh, I'm not saying it's bad talk. Obviously, excellent talk. We're only going to talk at you for 25 or 30 minutes. Not even, actually. We'll talk at you a bit, but then we want to throw it open and do some Q&A stuff, because we could drone on and put a PowerPoint up, but that's not really the right idea for us. So we'll give you a quick idea of what we do, and then maybe we'll... Is there a microphone roving around here? There is one, two, three. You're hidden behind the sun there. This is quite bright. We might get you to ask us questions, and then we're going to throw over to you to do something which so far most people cringe at first, but then actually love. It's not very physical, but it will involve you talking. Anyone want to leave the room now? If you're really good at it, it'll involve you talking up here. Uh, I think Katrina's got a bottle of wine for a winner. Is there a bottle of wine? Where's Katrina? <laughs> Katrina's gone to the liquor store to buy a <laughs> bottle of wine. <laughs> so first up, I might, I'll, I'll start by throwing over to Will, but we'll tell you just a little bit about why we're here and what we do, just so you can either acknowledge our credibility or dismiss it, and then move on from there to maybe um, get a few questions from you and give you a bit of advice. Yeah. Um, well, so you might have, might have got from the bio before, but uh, Rod and I, amongst uh, a bunch of other people at the Australian Nas National Centre for Public Awareness of... I, can't, I keep coming in and out. Maybe if I face this way. Uh, we, we're researchers and lecturers on science communication. Our work focuses mostly on how we can uh, look at all of the great work that all of you do and see how we can get a better interaction with the rest of society. So how your ideas can get turned into more useful policy or how you can get behaviour change in people or how you can uh, listen to the range of audiences out there and try and understand what it is that will get science into more useful places. So in, in our centre we do you know, a whole bunch of education and teaching amongst the um, undergraduates and PhDs and masters students, but we also do a lot of research on why it is that the interaction between science and the rest of society isn't as smooth as we might all want, why, it, why there's a few lumpy bits, why there's things that which, um, aren't going as swimmingly as we might hope. So some of that research is telling us new things about how we can do the interaction. But a lot of our work also focuses on some standard straight communications lessons, some simple ideas that from the range of communication, the range of science communication research, tell us what we can do about getting your ideas into the, into the head of a policymaker or into the head of an end user and turn that into action further down the track. 
Now, what we're going to do is, I think we'll, there's a couple of um, sorts of key lessons that, um, that we've been, uh, that we find is very useful to, to provide in this sort of space. But rather than just dive in and, and, and tell you a bunch of key lessons, I'd rather you know, ask a few questions. Are there, are there things that you are wondering about in terms of, OK, I'm going to meet a politician tomorrow. What should I say? Is anyone feeling hyper comfortable about that? You've got your... Yeah, your who's stump. stoked? Who can't wait to meet their politician? <laughs> We've got a, some enthusiastic hands and some halfway hands. These, the yeah, these are my favourites. <coughs> who's, who, who's, who's got the halfway hand? Who's a little bit uncertain about meeting their politician tomorrow? We've got a few there. And who thinks they may actually call in sick? <laughs> <laughs> a couple of honest people and then the rest of you. Because, I mean, a lot of what we focused on, we, we don't want to talk all about research. We're not going to quote papers at you. We actually want to talk about the realities based a lot on our experience as well as informed by research. Because we've been in the public domain a lot, yapping about stuff. We've taken a lot of hits. If you want to talk about being abused by commentators, particularly on climate change and stuff, we're your guys. We've been called some spectacular things by some spectacular people. So if you're concerned about what it feels like to be beaten up in the, in the public domain and social media, we can help you with that. We can form a little hugging circle and, and, and help get through that as well. So it's not all about, we're not going to quote textbooks at you. We're going to so, give you more. So for that, some of those people who had the halfway hand, you're a little bit nervous. What's, uh, what sorts of things are you thinking about and wondering about um, in terms of preparing for that conversation tomorrow? Do you want to dive in first? Yes. We might wait for a mic because we can hear you, but I don't know if everyone else can. So I work at CSIRO and I'm going with an agriculture hat on. I'm meeting, hopefully, Jill Fitzgibbon, the shadow agriculture minister. But I guess my focus is really, I know a bit about growing plants, but mostly I'm a soil scientist. I'm a little concerned as to how to, make, how to try and keep the tr conversation on a track that's probably, hopefully, most we can, both of us are going to get something out of, rather than me talking trying to pacify what I assume are going to be his greater interests more broadly in food production, which isn't, frankly, quite my field. So you want to keep the conversation rolling for at least the, what, the three minutes you get? How long do you get? 30, between three of us in total, but it depends on... OK. A, a, lot of, a lot of questions like that I would start by responding with, are, are you really clear on what it is you think you want to get out of it? And I don't mean I want him to like me, I want more money. I mean, can you go in, and this goes for anyone, anything really specific you'd like to see as a result? It doesn't have to be science related. It could just be they ever want to hear from you again. It could just be that he nods and smiles and remembers your name. But think about something specific to start with, because then you can start to, to work towards that as, a, as a, an end goal. Do you have anything? Yeah. What specifically? Um, so I guess my field is, like I say, I'm a soil scientist, and a lot of the stuff that I research is probably fairly boring to most people. But most people eat food, and food grows in soil. And I suppose trying to get the food, I, as an advocate for soil scientists, I'd say that the soil science is often the, the poor cousin of anything else to do with agriculture, despite the fact it's so central to food production. So and you wanted to I'm say soil, to get. you wanted to think soil rocks? Yes. So to speak, can you say that, soil rocks? <laughs> I think that's the problem. That might upset the I geologists. <laughs> is that the important thing? He walks away going, soil's awesome? Partially. Oh, I'm not taking the piss. Yeah. I mean, that's what he wants. I think that might be a good thing to get across. I mean, you, you've got to, if that's the thing to, to get to, you I still think, got to... I think a key one is that soil is a non-renewable resource and we better look after it. Ah. That's, not a, that's not a bad slogan at all. That's yeah. something that I didn't necessarily know. I thought it was, I thought it was renewable. Um, so that's something that, that might be planted in his head. But you spoke before about, you know, everyone, everyone loves plants and goes to plants. Now, uh, that may, you know, that's fine because plants and food are relevant to everyone. There's a great place to start and to connect from things that people and politicians are already interested in. Now, they're already interested in making sure Australia has viable agriculture into the future. Now, they're, they're, not, they're not numpties. They know that plants grow in some sort of thing. And, most and, of them know that. Uh, you know, know. Well, I assume most of them know that, 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 that there is something going on. Now, yeah, they might have not very much knowledge about the difference between um, different qualities of soil or, or how important soil is or what it does. But that's, that's your hook, to start from something that they would already be fairly interested in and, and go from there. The other thing to say is, is if they ask a question that's not 100% your area of expertise, that's not necessarily a problem. You know, 
compared to everyone else in, in that room tomorrow and possibly in this room, you probably know a fair bit. You know a lot more than me. So, oh, can I throw in there actually what happened earlier? Does anyone know anything else about Cole, just to, to pick on you? Yes, I do. OK, we want to talk to you. I'm not an expert. Shit. Like that, <laughs> that's not going to go. I'm, I'm picking on you because everyone would do it. That, that's probably not your best approach. Shrieking I'm not an expert in one way or another is probably not your best approach. You know, as, as Will's saying, you might be the best expert in the room, or at least you know more than they do. I'm not telling you to make stuff up and, and leap well beyond your expertise, but you might have to um, step a little bit beyond or be a bit more opinion focused in what you do here. It's, it's all right to have opinions. There's a classic thing in, in science communication where people, uh, they know in, in terms of their scientific literature, and sorry, I'm, I'm trying to focus this way because my microphone works when I'm facing this way. Um, they know in the scientific literature and the scientific conferences, they're not the number one expert on that topic in the world. But you know they've read all of those papers and, and say they're in the top ten. That means they're you know they know more about that field than anyone in this room, anyone possibly in Australia. And so yes, being being the number one expert might be a thing that you might aspire to in the scientific world. In terms of a politician or in terms of a wider audience out there, they don't care about the difference between that. You know they they will, you will know a lot more than them, and they will be happy to learn those things if you talk in in their language. So who else is? Yeah, other people. Uh, a little bit anxious about your meeting tomorrow. Or other questions, it's okay to take it in your own direction. Down the back. Hand. Under the sun at the back of the room. Hi, how are you going? Um, I'm Hannah from ANU. I wanted to talk to my politician about the importance of genetic engineering in increasing our crop yield in the future. My politician that I'm meeting has a very strong anti GM stance. <laughs> <laughs> It's problem. good that you've done your research, though. Yeah, it is. Yeah, not going in blindly. But can you give any advice on how I... So far, my advice has been just talk on my research and avoid the GM debate. Do you, do you know, uh, in, in that research, do you, do you know other environmental issues that they're really passionate about in a positive way? No. <laughs> uh, what about any issue? What are they into? Uh, are... They're into organic farmers and... OK. Uh, Yes. Are they, are they into climate change or um, solving world hunger? Or? Uh, they're into indigenous affairs and health, and they appear to support climate change. Um, but they have a very anti-GM public stance, yes. How much do you have to talk about GM per se as opposed to the results of your research is the first question. Um, in my summary, I've avoided pretty much all GM <laughs> um, to just talk about my research. That's been my approach to tackle this, but I wondered if you had any other... Well, there are other options. Again, depending on what you want out of it, you're meeting a politician <laughs> and their, their interest isn't necessarily facts in the same way that yours might be. If you want to try and keep a door open, do you know much about that, that minister or that, that politician's area, their, their region, anything about it? I mean, seriously, if you walked in there and started telling funny stories or a shared moment that had nothing to do with the science, it sounds frivolous, but I'm not kidding. You might walk away and they go, at least there is that one person who came and they told that hilarious joke. They understand my area. I wonder what they're into. You might put a human face on it. If you try and look for a magical cure to inject their anti-GM-ness, yeah. Yeah. We, we ain't the guys for that. In, I, no in three is. minutes, there is, no, there is no, there's no magic bullet. There's no anything. And you know, someone like that, you can have, um, you could actually build, there's, there's great stories of people that are really antagonistic on issues like that. And they become friends. And they might talk to each other every day or you know, every week for years on end. And there's a, there's a great story about this in the US. Never convert each other on that issue. So they still remain opposed on that particular thing. So you have to accept that you may not ever be able to change someone's mind on that particular issue. But that doesn't mean you can't get a whole lot of other wins out of it. You can, uh, you can learn more about their world as a politician. That, for, for them, you can become, OK, that's a trustworthy person on that side of the debate. I don't necessarily agree, but I know that I can trust that person to, in good faith, say, say their argument. So there are a lot of other things, rather than converting them to a, a different side, that might be listed as a win. Well, the one thing we can be sure you won't do is convert them. <coughs> I promise you that. Mm. If they're anti, you're not going to do it. And they're not looking to be swayed. But talk about anything you share values on, anything you can sh tell shared stories about. You may not even get to your specific research if they say, oh, you're into GM. You could say, no, I'm into making food crops more, not no, but I'm into making food crops more sustainable. And, and that's really what interests me, because food's really important. And then you can just keep talking about something else. 
Yep. Mm. There's no magic solution to converting people, other than what well, guns or money help, but we don't have either of those. But yeah, Everyone we don't advocate them in Science Meets Parliament. Uh, no, no, no guns. Take money in, they probably like that, but don't take guns. So what are some other um, anxieties or issues that people might be thinking in here? In the middle? Hi, so um, I'm a coastal and estuarine ecologist and I've got a meeting tomorrow with someone that is really interested in European wasps and is in a landlocked electorate. Um, so they are on the Environment Committee, so I'm wondering how much I tell them about marine issues and green engineering in the marine environment and um, restoration in the marine environment versus trying to swat up on European wasps overnight and um, <laughs> bend to their interests. Are they, are they really hostile to European wasps? or? I think they want to eradicate them. OK. <laughs> we could start with how crappy are European wasps, eh? And then move on to something else. If they ask you about your expertise, you could talk about drowning them, I suppose, if you need to. <laughs> Again, this isn't necessarily about conveying your science per se. You, you, I mean, this is relationship building stuff here. And it's easy to get caught up in the whole, I've got to deliver my science, I've got to get the science message across. If you're looking at this, and I think many of you are, as, as potentially trying to develop some long-term relationship, it might not be with the person you're allocated. But they may know someone who goes, estuarine stuff, or what is it, river stuff? I've got a mate down the hall who'd be interested. Maybe you should give them a ring next week. Like, there's, there's more to be done here than just trying to inject science into people's brains. And arguably, that's the last thing you should do unless it comes up in a, in a really fruitful and natural way. By the same token, um, it, going back to that idea of expertise, we in, in the scientific world think of people very much as, you know, they're an expert on that area and an expert on that area and they become quite small um, areas uh, by definition. Uh, politicians by their nature have to actually be total generalists. They have to be able to have an opinion on every single issue that's facing society from European wasps to uh, coastal environments to uh, the other thing. <laughs> all of those other things yeah. that, that we don't normally... But they have to be able to generate some sort of stance or opinion on that. And realistically, politicians are interested in... You know, an Australian politician of any political stripe is interested in best outcomes for Australia into the future. And even if they're a landlocked electorate, it doesn't mean they don't know a whole lot about the importance of the coastal environment to Australia, you know, for, um, for environmental reasons and for, obviously, tourism and fishing and communities and all of those kinds of things. They're still interested in that. They might not live there. Uh, you know, Canberra's a landlocked electorate, but, you know, I like, I like the, the beach. I like, the, I like everything about the coast as well. So don't pigeon that, pigeonhole them too much. They're just like people. <laughs> Was I supposed to tell them that? But it's easy to forget that. They're human beings, and, and if you can strike up a rapport, that might be more important than any information exchange. Potentially, unless you're not looking at this as a long-term thing, either with this parliamentarian or another one. And, and absolute worst case is practice, and we're going to give you an opportunity to practice something a bit later on, but this is a practice environment as well. It doesn't matter if they don't come away loving what you've done. That's, if, if that's your end goal, a lot of you might be sad. But you don't need to be sad. There are other things you can do. Are there other folks? Down back. Hi there, Rob Agus from the Australian Synchrotron again. I'm just wondering, what is the best way to, to leave them with your key take-home message, the thing that you really want to emphasise in, in the meeting? Is, is it as simple as you know, a, a, a very quick statement that they could you know, internalise and walk away with, or is it something you have to reiterate? Is it, do you have any strategies for, for that? This kind of comes a bit to what we'll be doing before. The thing that I would advocate as much as possible for, for anyone trying to leave a message to stick, and that's whether you're a scientist dealing with a policymaker, or a, yeah, a parent dealing with a child, or any sort of situation where you want to com com um, communicate something pretty important. I think stories are absolutely critical. Now, there's a whole, whole different way of telling stories and a whole range of different stories. Sometimes it might be actual human stories about, you know, um, my friend X and continue it like that. But there's a storytelling structure. And um, we might as well go into this now because, you, because you've asked. Maybe we start. Start also, before you get to that, which I agree with, I'm not trying to... No, that's right. Do it like. What a lot of people forget, and it seems to be particularly endemic in the sciences, you walk in and talk about how damned important your research is. And what you forget that what you're saying in brackets is how damned important it is to me. That's what people are hearing. Um, years ago when I first started talking to people who had anything to do with lobbying politicians on behalf of scientists, 
How bad can I swear, Katrina? Can I, in, a, in a quote, can I use naughty words? Oh, I'm going to be on YouTube. I'll back it off. Be, be, like he cares about swearing on YouTube. Oh, I don't mind my reputation. <laughs> he walked up and he said to this room full of very keen science communicators who wanted to turn politicians, what you've got to remember is science is just another interest group. I abbreviate it. It's just another interest group. And so if you march in with any kind of other attitude, you're going to look like a fool. But if you can, if you can start to talk to them about what's in it for them, that's the cliche the consultants use all the time. The world's favourite radio station is WIIFM. What's in it for me? You've got to put it in their terms. It's obvious, but it's 100% true. If I talk to you about stuff that's not of interest to you, you're going to blank out. If I tell you how important it is that you hear me, you're still going to blank out. So put it in their terms. Then I think, yeah, roll yeah. onto the story thing. So, but start with that. What's important to them? It might be tiny, vaguely related to your research. It might not be at all. It could be about the economy in the area where the synchrotron runs. But put yourself in their shoes first, then... Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Stories. Definitely. In, terms of, in terms of putting yourselves in their shoes, you know, they're dealing with heaps and heaps of different problems. You know, any politician, depending on where they are, you know, uh, government ministers, obviously, they've got much more deciding power. But the rest of politicians are trying to solve all of these different problems all the time. Now, understanding more about them is, is more useful than saying, OK, here's my problem. You know, from, from our end, I need to get a new piece of equipment or... Um, have some more money for this. That's not their problem. They don't care about that. Their problem is something different. So if you can put things in terms of their problem, then you're going to be a lot better off. You all, if you ever had a research student and they have to fill in an ethics form and they have to tell the participants in their research how their participants are going to benefit, the standard thing I hear from research students is they get to participate in important research. <laughs> You don't understand how valuable this would be to my research. And you just have to go, ah, OK, I get it, you're new. <laughs> No one cares. I mean, honestly, no one cares. But if you can tell them a good story, <laughs> they're going to start to hear you. And that kind of leads into what Will was talking about. First up, as I say, don't say because it's important, because that's a meaningless statement without context. Absolutely meaningless. I need money because this is important is even worse. But if you can tell them a tale, something that might float their boat, tweak their emotions, relate to their electorate, relate to them personally, you might be getting closer. And I'll throw back to you, you were starting to talk about yeah. story so, so again, a tale or a story that, that might float their boat, that, that resonates with them. And again, you, your story doesn't... Do, you, we'll come to the conclusion in a second, but just to foreshadow, your conclusion doesn't want to be, I need money. The conclusion should be something that they might be able to do. But the storytelling structure, and, and we're just jumping to this now because, because you asked about this, um, that... After we finish um, having this Q&A session in a few minutes, what we're going to be doing is uh, breaking up into a practice session where you practice your, your 60-second pitch of your science tomorrow. Now, we'll explain all, the, all of the, the dynamics of that in and a bit. And this will link to your question about take-home message or something like that. But a technique that's very useful. And, and it's a technique that you all actually, well, we all use implicitly um, in describing our science in, in journal articles or in other places where we're talking to students. It's a technique we use in a lot of different places, but it's a nice, really simple um, set of three steps that you can make, and it will tell a story. So this comes from a lot of script writing. A lot of script writers in um, writing TV shows or, or other things like that will break a story down into three segments, and, but, and therefore. Now... We used, to, we used to, to put it in the terms of science. We're used to the and. The and is the, uh, here's all of the literature that's gone before. Here's all the things we know. Here's all the things we know. Here's all the things we know. And that led to this method, and that led to this data, and that led to this conclusion, that led to us needing to do more research, and this, and that. It's a long list. Now, the trick is it's dangerous for us as scientists to get stuck in the world of and. That's the world where we say there's so much out there, and... To be able to solve your problem, you need to know this, and you need to know this, and you need to know this, all of these kinds of things. It's useful to set up a bit of the background, to say, OK, here's some things that um, are relevant in this area. We understand this. But, but the key thing is to pivot and to put a but into your story. More but. but. Sorry? More but in your story. More exactly. but in your story. story. should be full of but. But we don't know this. But we're doing this wrong. But... We're not solving this problem, but there's a gap. Now, even, we do... even the punctuation of that, when he's saying, and you do this, and you do that, and you do the background, but, and the whole room stops, it's a punctuating word, and it, it redirects attention, or it regathers attention. And, and anyone knows that that's the point at which you start listening. 
That's the point. All of that stuff that's gone before, that's just about establishing your, your logos and your pathos. Or and your Aramis and yeah, Porthos. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think those, those ones. Yeah, all those, yeah. <laughs> but that's just about establishing your background and your credentials. And a politician at that point, they're, they're just listening, listening for trust signals. Can I trust this person? Are they saying really weird things or are they saying mostly things that I've heard before? All fine. Uh, that's all good. If you say you know, odd things, then they, they, that will flag in their brain. But they don't care about that. But they could care when you start to pivot and you say, but, but there's this thing, or but we need to know this, or but Australia could do better doing that. So in all of your science, think about what comes next. What's in the next few years? What are you trying to solve now? What's in, in the next future? Maybe in, in your science or your, your field, the, the larger area, what are the things that need to happen into the future? And that comes to the therefore. Now, the therefore is the conclusion. But this is a point where, in responding to the but, you can say, therefore, you know, this is what we need to do. We as a society, we as a community, we as a politician. Now, at that point, be really wary of saying, therefore, we need $100 million. Yeah, therefore, give us more money for research is a little you know, bit generic. It, it could be a really use, much, much lower goals that therefore are, are a better thing to do. Therefore, what we're working on is connecting with new partners in the United States. To and you could, the, the genetic example, if you said, listen, we know Australia is suffering from food shortages, salinity is an issue, drought tolerance is a problem for a lot of staple crops, blah, 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 blah. But what we don't know enough about is how these plants operate, you know, at a molecular level, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, understanding more about how the mechanisms operate could really help us feed more people in the river arena. And if you start to tell stories like that, then maybe you could sort of sneak in, by the way, I'm looking at that, is it genetic? A little bit. But you know, look, <laughs> you're starting to tell that story, the, the, the and but therefore thing, it, it's a standard storytelling technique. We see it all the time, as Will said, that captures people's attention. So your therefore might be your take home message, your but might be the take home message as well. Yep. They go, oh, but we got a problem here. I'll remember that problem. We have a, a hand. Yeah, just, um, just a really quick question then in terms of, You've got these three different parts. What's the proportion, I guess? It's a bit quantitative, but um, you know, should you spend a lot more time in the and and the but and the therefore should be a bit more direct? I'd say watch their eyes. Okay. If, if they start to glaze over in the and, and, and section, you, you've got to pivot fast and you've got to say, OK, they're, they're sitting around thinking, what's the point, what's the point, what's the point? I get you that you're a lovely, excellent scientist. They're waiting for you to say something with a point. Uh, they need to hear a little bit of background. If you, if you dive in the first word and say, but, and they're like, oh, hang on, slow down, that's, that's a little bit too much. Give it, give it a little bit, but you know, pay attention to them. Uh, and this is a conversation too. So you might start saying and, their eyes glaze over, you go, oh, but there's other things going on, they might ask you a question. So this thing can reset and flick backwards and forwards too. So you might cut your butt in early, cut off some of your ands, this is getting worse. <laughs> they may ask you questions, you go back to a few more ands again, that might be a reasonable, remember this isn't, if you just stand there and start lecturing them, <coughs> clear your throat, pull out your palm cards and give them the hand but therefore speech. So natural. Politicians deal in the world of conversation. Like really, they, they deal mm. in the world of talking face to face to people, looking them in the eye and talking about the things that matter to them. And as much as possible, if you can do that, that's a really important thing. We're not trained for that in the world of science. We communicate you know, through journal articles, through email, through PowerPoint. And face to face communication is, is you reserved really for you know maybe with your supervisors or, or a small group of people who you develop a lot of a lot of interactions with, but politicians do this interaction all the time, all day, day in, day out. That's the world in which they operate. So pay attention to them. You know, look look them in the eye and and talk about the things in a conversational way. Strip away detail. You're going to be uncomfortable. There's going to be details about your research you cannot give them, and you absolutely should not. Yes, and don't say. Try, try to avoid that tangent of, oh, well, there's that, uh, we've just learnt some new literature that says this other thing. And maybe, maybe yeah. there's a question. Is this going to be good that. for crop research? Yeah, except for the following 10 different subconditions. Boom, they're gone. You know, you can say, look, there are some issues, there are things to be explored. But in general, it's going this way. So how about we talk about that further over coffee and cakes at dinner? Whatever it may be, like, you want to, you want to, You've got to let go of the idea that you have to hand over all the caveats, all the data, et cetera, et cetera. They're not looking for that. It, your scientist colleagues will, the politicians aren't. And if they want to know more, they'll ask you or they have their advisors ask. And that's the best thing. If they're asking more, you've started a conversation. Uh, I think down. we're allowed that, but I think Katrina's going to start tapping us on the yeah. shoulder. Yeah, about to stop this bit. 
Sorry, I'll make it quick. Um, it's Chris Wirin from Defence Science Technology Group. I'm just thinking of the expectations and the time factors that are involved. Is it realistic just to expect the ministers to come away with an appreciation that we're doing research in this specific area and we're partnering and we're making strategic alliances? Is that a good enough objective? That's not a bad objective at all. I mean, they, they understand the world of partnering and, and alliances. They understand collaboration. And for them, that's, that's a good thing. If, if, if Australia can leverage whatever its science dollar to, to get more, to connect more with the rest of the world or to, with industrial partners, those kinds of things, they're happy with that kind of thing. I'd so, I'd so credit it and say, is it? it? Like, is it a good thing for you? Yes. Would that be a good thing to come away with, just so they get the impression that you're doing things together and it's all wonderful? And Yes, yes, but uh, th we've been talking about maybe uh, it's not affecting policy. I don't expect them to actually change policy overnight from what I say, but yeah. I just want them to come away with an appreciation that we're looking at this issue and we're actually using our resources wisely. That's great. And if, th if they come away with a strong sense, that guy, he was very interesting about this thing, that's, that's an awesome thing to be left with. They, it may never come up again for that particular person, but if they're talking to a colleague, perhaps they'll say, oh, I know a guy. What was his name again? I've got his card. You know, that, that might be enough. Leaves a, a, or it may a, not even be, the, it, it may yeah. be just a general impression. Yeah. I, Australia is doing work in this field and that kind of stuff comes up again. They may not have all the details, but just a, just a, a seed of an idea is where things grow, grow from. We may have to get into the doing. When you get into the doing, because we can see the and and eyes are starting. <laughs> and we'll run out of time and Katrina will be mad with us and she's damn mean when she gets angry. So you're going to get a chance tomorrow to talk with your politician. Now it is going to be a constrained, constrained few minutes, minute or whatever it is. So what we want to do in this, in this next uh, 45 minutes is give you a chance to practice what you would actually say to your politician in that moment. Now, of course, this is you know, a very different, different environment. You're sitting around a table with, with like-minded people who are in the same boat, not politicians. But it gives us a chance to actually think, OK, how would I structure my story? How would I structure my good afternoon, minister? then what do I say? How would I start thinking about that? So going back before to the and, but, therefore. Think about that structure. You don't have to use it. There's plenty of ways. You might think of other stories to tell, other ways to connect your relevance. We'd like you to think about that now. And then, in your tables, if you could pitch to each other that 60-second pitch. Yeah, we want you to go 30 to 60 seconds. You're gonna, you want to tell a succinct story about something to do with your work that you think is a story worth telling. No more than 60 seconds. We're time Nazis. 30 is better. You have to leave stuff out. You just want to get across the one thing that you would like them to walk away with you think is really critical. So 30, 60 seconds. Take, say, what, five or six minutes now. We'll, we'll shout out when it's over. Prepare what you'd like to say. Then what you're going to do, I might stand up. Oh, I'm getting creaky. Then what you're going to do is to each of you in turn at your tables, tell each other your 30 to 60 second pitch. So you will be sharing. Once you've done that, you've got to pick a table winner. And then there'll be more going on after that. The table winners will then duke it out. We're going to fill this area with jelly and sub mud. Sub and finals, a, and, and yeah. it, Australia's got talent, and Australia gets yes. Katrina's Simon wine stash. Powell's coming. So the first thing, if take five to six minutes, let's call it six, and we will call you up at six minutes. 30 to 60 second pitch of your own. Use and but therefore if you're unclear about how to go about so it. So think about first, what do you want them to come away, for, away from that meeting, from you? And then think about a story structure that would get to that point. Any questions? You can ask us individual questions. We'll turn the mics off and, and wander around. Over Go to you. Alrighty. In case you haven't started already, your next task, in turn at, at your table, read out your pitch to your table, in turn, and then at the end of that, we want you to vote on the best one at your table. Ah, uh, Peter Bourne building there. Are you with me? Because the people who win the table, we're going to take you aside and we're going to go to the next heat. So, in turn at your table, read out your pitch, and we're going to come around and ask you for winners in a few minutes.
Okay, now your job, if you haven't already, is to vote a table representative, champion, victim, sacrificial goat, whatever you want to, <laughs> depending on your mood. And one, have you done that? Do people have a table? Who, who does? Three winners, so one of them. Three more minutes. Three more minutes. <laughs> Well, we can, we can tell you the instructions and then when you're done, then, then we can continue with the instructions. So. Yep. so the plan will be once we get your champions of table, we're going to break you into four subgroups. One group will go over there to Katrina, who's, you've probably heard of her before. We'll take, oh, Will's better at counting them. He'll take the back, say, one of the back five tables. Katrina, do you want to point them out? You know who they are. Okay, the next mob will go with Dr. Crystal Evans. You all know who Crystal is. She's a legend of stage and screen and science. She's going to take, as we say, the six tables there. Does that work? Sounds great. Will will go with these. these six tables. Who's got no allocation? How many got left? Just two, That's three, three, four. I can have them as well. To you be honest, I ball the other people and, and, and pick a um, uh, semi-final that you reckon you could win. And then, the, <laughs> or if you all hate the idea of it, just send out the person who's <laughs> slowest to refuse. So the people at that table, when you've got your champion, go to Katrina. The other mob in the middle here come to me. This mob go to... I'll go here somewhere. Crystal, Will will be over here. Does that make sense? Do you know where you're going? Couple more minutes while the last table pick a champion. But if you already have one, can you start to meander over to the areas we've told you? All good? They're still thinking. Are they still planning over there? I think they're doing rock, paper, scissors. Katrina's mob are arm wrestling for who wants to do Fa it the famous least. mode of decision making in science. Democracy, where's that ever gotten us? I'm assuming therefore two, uh, three of the four groups have a, a winner. Can I have the winners up here? You're all winners, <laughs> but what I mean is the specific winners of this event. Don't be afraid. Did they slip out the door? Seriously? Who's pulled the, oh, I have a phone call. What? Yeah, no. Where's oh. Daniel? He was, he was the winner from my group. There. There you go. He was hiding. <laughs> we, we got a winner, a winner from over here? We have a winner. Now, now I, I may have um, embellished Katrina's words. She doesn't have a bo bottle of wine, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's a metaphoric bottle of yeah, wine. Yeah, it's a metaphorical bottle of wine. You're terribly welcome. <laughs> but, but you do win glory and, and, and look... We'll find a bottle of wine one day. If you win, it'll help your career. If you lose, it won't harm your career. Let's look at it that way. <laughs> so, so please, one after the other, I guess. Yeah, we can... one after the other. We're looking at no more than 60 seconds, time Nazis. It'll be judged by popular acclaim. Yes. But hear them all, and then we'll do clapping, and, and I'll use an app to um, work a it out. A clapometer. You'll be yes. obliged to come up here one at a time, though. Please tell us what your name is before you start, because not everyone here knows you yet, even though you're bathed in glory already. Over to our first person. Welcome her aboard, come on. Start? Go. Yes, great. Hi everyone, my name's Anna McDonald. I'm from the University of Canberra. My field's wildlife genetics, which means I use genetic tools to look at ecological questions. And I'm particularly interested in addressing questions that um, will tell us something about how to manage wildlife. So that might be conservation of native species, or it might be understanding invasive species. And one of the things that we're blessed with at the University of Canberra is a room full of poo, which we use to do this with. So I'm going to tell you about that now. So if you have elusive or rare species, these can be quite difficult to study if you want to know what they eat or how they move through the countryside. So we can get DNA from non-invasive samples, and this can include faeces, or also potentially hair or soil or water samples. And we can use that to understand our wildlife. And one of, example of this is detecting invasive foxes in Tasmania. So most of our poo samples were collected for this purpose, 
but they're also telling us a lot about other predators, including feral cats, devils and quolls, and what they're eating, as well as detecting foxes. Now, one of the things I also wanted to emphasise with this was if we're going to use genetic tools to look at questions like this, we want to have a good idea of what the limitations of those tools are. And so we've also been doing some work to look at this. And this is an important concept with all of the scientific tools we use. And that's something I'd be happy to talk about further. Come on. That's right. 142. Great talk. Long, but great. <laughs> Other than that, very good. That's all right, though. We didn't give you a clock. Who wants to be next up? Come on over. Uh, so I'm uh, Professor Daniel Shaddock from the ANU, and I'll be talking to my local member here in Canberra, which is nice. Um, OK, so 100 years ago, Einstein predicted something called gravitational waves exist. And these are ripples in the curvature of space time. And if we could measure these things, it gives us something akin to listening to space rather than just being able to see it. 20 years ago, I started working on this as an honours student here at ANU, and two weeks ago, we announced that we discovered the first gravitational waves. We saw two black holes co coalescing 1.2 billion light years away, which was fantastic and very exciting. Um, in fact, I heard a commentator on Late Line the other day from the USA that he ranked it amongst the greatest achievements of our species, which is always nice to hear about your work. Um, <laughs> We've already started working on the next generation of detectors, and for 10 years I actually worked at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory on the space-based version of the LIGO gravitational wave detector that saw these waves. Now that I'm back at ANU, uh, we have a very large group of, of talented scientists and engineers working on a whole bunch of different issues in space. And there are people all around Canberra, not just in my department, but at Stromlo and also at the University of New South Wales, who are all working in space. Now, Canberra is a bit of a one-horse town when it comes to industry. We have the public service and we have education, but not really a lot else. And I think there's a real opportunity here for Canberra to take the lead in advancing space and space industry in Australia. Australia is the only OECD, OECD country without a space agency, and I think that we can start doing some things here to engage better with industry and other universities to really start to build a new industry in this area in Canberra. And my question to Andrew Lee is, what can we be doing to make this happen? Thank you. Again, great story. We've gone from rooms full of poo to, what is it, one of the greatest achievements of humankind? I know whenever I hear that, I feel good too. Uh, also quite long, but other than that, great content. 126, that was. Our next person. Hi, I'm Karen Lee Waddell, and I'm a postdoc fellow with Starro Astronomy and Space Science. I recently completed my, completed my PhD in Ontario, Canada, and moved here to work with the brand new Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder radio telescope. I use world-class telescopes to study galaxy interactions in order to understand the, the processes that are governing the universe. I'm also actively involved in public outreach and education initiatives, which can showcase the applicability of science and also inspire the next generation of scientists. Thirty-three seconds within time. My group. That was my group. <laughs> more space. Are we going to have him more space? No more space. Next, sir. Hi, I'm Andrew Bean from CSIRO, where we work on outbreaking diseases. You know, every year a half a million people die from influenza. This is a tragedy, but there is an answer to this, and it's vaccination. However, vaccination uh, and vaccine production use methods that were developed in the 1930s. It's time to bring this into the 21st century. We're working on new techniques to help radically improve vaccine production. Now, this has real implications for our Australian vaccine production industries, but not only that, it means cheaper vaccines for us here. Not only here in the first world, but obviously in the third world as well. Thank you. Now we're curing sick children. I mean, you, you can't compete with that. Can we get all our, our four competitors? First, thank you for the bravery. <laughs> Will, you're going to do the noiseometer? Yep. We can do that. Yeah, we can do it. With, I'll, I'll hold, hold my phone up and pretend I got an app. And <laughs> <laughs> we're voting via we're, a we're, claim. We've got, we've got Andrew there. Daniel, can we, can we, can we stand all four up, please? Adele and Karen. OK, we'll go in the same order that they, they did. Can we, get, can we get your rounds of applause and the loudest round of applause? We'll get Katrina's metaphorical bottle of wine. 
Please start with Adele. <laughs> yeah, good, good. <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> Karen. <laughs> and Andrew. I think the app's pretty clear. I, I, I think there was actually a... I think the app says, Andrew... Andrew, the break the app. <laughs> he will be available for autographs at the dinner and he <laughs> might take donations as well for his public speaking career. Thank you all. I just wanted to say, in terms of the group that I spoke to, and I know listening to some of the other groups when we were walking around, a lot of you have got great stories about your research. You know, what, you know what you've been doing and you know what problems you've been working on. Now, there's ways to hone that, there's ways to polish that. Obviously, running over time or adding in too many details, you know that already. Dive in with a conversation, talk to your politicians and listen to them. You've got a whole lot of stories already in you, but if you're paying attention to the conversation, then the moment they ask a question, that's the moment to go. That's when they're hooked into your story and they want to know more. That's the goal. And thanks for being willing participants. If you guys sat there going like this, it would have been much tougher for us. And it's all about us. You know that, right? <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. We'll see you at Din Din's.